say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt I really right. Right. I was so And I just thought, well, I had figured it, out. Wow. I it was that wrong. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from George Church. It was recorded in July 2015 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So, uh, I'm all about risk. Uh, the, uh, it's a very ancient and I think deeply human urge to want to harness nature, whether it's fire or living creatures. And uh, that's what I'll tell you about. Uh, my, my father was an uh, Air Force pilot. He would fly the, the uh, strata tankers that would be full of fuel that they would inject by mating with a B-52 bomber, uh, and uh, I think the hypothesis is this was keeping America safe. Um, and the B-52, of course, had the ultimate fire in it, which was uh, hydrogen bombs. And uh, they never dropped it on our enemies, but they did drop two of them on North Carolina at one point um, when one of these mating procedures didn't quite work out. So my uh, father had... Uh, harnessed uh, fire and air while my uncle Johnny was uh, uh, conquering uh, the animals of uh, earth and, and water. He, uh, family legend had it that Johnny, when he was a uh, pre-teenager, he would um, disappear for days at a time and he would sew his, his uh, Native American name into his foot. This was his imaginary name. And uh, and would come back uh, with live snakes, plural, in his bare hands uh, to sell to the people that made the anti-venom uh, for people who accidentally got bit by snakes. And uh, so he, when he grew up, naturally, he became a, a wrangler of sea creatures. And one day he asked me to go across this little four-inch wide plank that went across. He said, go fetch me the pail on the other side of the pond. This, wooden plank without any railings. And I thought, hey, that sounds like fun. I just went, run across it. My hypothesis was that, that uh, I could trust my Uncle John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about halfway across, I see that uh, underneath me is like this swirling mass of muscle of sharks and really ugly hammerheads and stuff. And uh, but I, so I ran across, I got the pail, I went back and I said, this is a pretty cool job he's got. Uh, I could do this. Uh, and so I grew up wild, kind of like my uncle, um, into earth and water uh, of all sorts. And, uh, and this wasn't like your pristine white beaches. This was smelly mud uh, was what I loved. And, uh, and it was in my backyard, and smelly mud. And we would, I would go out and fetch blue crabs and mullet from this mud, and, and uh, family would eat them, and we would... Uh, there was an albino dolphin that we caught, or the fishermen brought in one day, and we'd keep it wet until, the, until they could take it to the local uh, show. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the hypotheses I learned, that, you know, when I was swimming in one of the p ponds uh, and I saw bubbles coming towards me really fast, the hypothesis that they were bubbles coming toward me really fast was probably incorrect, and I should get out of the water because they were... They were uh, alligator eyes, and uh, so I'd get out of the water, and I would scoop up a little 
a little of the water, and uh, in it one day was uh, this really ferocious looking water bug. I mean, it, was, it turned out it was a predatory uh, water bug, and I kept it in a little jar. And, uh, and the next day I, I looked in there, and the, it was gone. And I, and I thought, gee, I'm such a, a cruel, uh, you know, I didn't feed it the right thing, and I didn't feed it enough, and it was just, it just disintegrated. There, weren't even, there were just little bits of it left. And I, and I was just blaming myself. And then I looked inside, I looked around, and, uh, and there was a dragonfly in there, uh, in the, sitting up on the top, hiding away from me. And I said, that dragonfly ate my bug. Uh, <laughs> that was my hypothesis. Uh, and, uh, but I wasn't really sure. I couldn't figure out how the dragonfly got into the seal jar. And that was the weak point of my hypothesis. <laughs> so I... Uh, so, you know, my, no, nobody in my family was a scientist, and so I had to figure this out myself. And I was, I was mildly dyslexic, so I would focus on the science books that had a lot of pictures. And I, I figured it out, and when I figured out, it was, it was really one of, it was a big thrill. And I said, well, I could do this for the rest of my life, you know. I could do this. And uh, so uh, I was also in charge of, the, of uh, taking care of the, the yard. Uh, we had about an acre of land, um, and it was... Uh, uh, it was, uh, let's say that the neighbor's yard on either side would look like a golf course. It was beautiful, green, Florida grass, and, and you could just, you could putt on it. Uh, and ours was like 30% uh, dirt and 70% this thing called, this plant called sand spurs. And I don't know, every year, you know, sand spurs. But for those of you who haven't seen them, you really have to imagine the most devious, uh, sharp, uh, tenacious uh, seeds that would stick onto you like magnet and it would hurt. And uh, so I was paid uh, a penny a uh, plant. These are these sprawling plants covered with sand spur seeds. A uh, penny a plant to pull them out of the yard. And I was also supposed to clear the, the, the woods that we had that, that separated our lawn from the, <laughs> from the mud uh, that was uh, the bay. And, uh, and I would go in there with this double-edged axe, uh, that was my toy, and I would, uh, I would clear it out. But the, the process of getting rid of the sand spurs and, the, and the, the underbrush from the woods was hopeless in Florida where things would grow so fast. By the time I got kind of halfway through, the first half was already grown back. And uh, so, I, so uh, one day, uh, my best friend Wayne was over, and, uh, and we thought we would use advanced physics, optics, that is, and uh, we would harness the Florida sun and we would uh, kill the sand spurs and other living things um, by focusing this magnifying glass on to the sand spurs. And uh, this death ray really worked like a charm. Uh, it, uh, the thing would burst in flames and, uh, and then we'd stamp it out and then we'd move on to the next sand spur. We, we did this you know, we had just inexhaustible energy, and uh, um, not the sun, but us. And uh, <laughs> and then Wayne had to go home, and uh, and I'm sitting in the you know kitchen, and uh, a couple hours later, a neighbor comes over and uh, knocks on the door. And I'm the only one home, so I open the door, and I and he says, uh, "I'm really glad that you guys are finally taking care of that that uh, awful looking woods that you had in the back." Uh, and I say, yep. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he starts to walk back to his house, and he says, ah, that's a nice fire you got. And I say, I try to look real calm. <laughs> <laughs> I wait, wait, wait until he goes away. And, and, he, uh, and, he, uh, and so I go out, and I look, and sure enough, there's the entire woods is on fire. <laughs> ten, flames going up 10 feet or more. And <laughs> And we had so carefully put out all these fires uh, that we had started with the sun. And, uh, and so uh, at this point, my confidence in, uh, in, uh, in fire, in my knowledge of fire, is uh, diminished. But I still, have, I still have one, you know, secret weapon, which is the element of water. So I, I have a great deal of experience with hoses uh, and garden hose technology. And so I go... <laughs> And, you know, in the movies, they sometimes wonder, why is it they never dial 911? You know, they come up with some really complicated plot twist for why they can't do it. And my plot twist was that I didn't really like talking to adults that much. And <laughs> I, 
especially if they were get likely to put me in jail for arson or something like that. And so, and besides, I was super busy putting out a fire. <laughs> so I put out, I put out the fire, and uh, and the and the, you know lessons were learned uh, of sorts. And uh, and you know, and I, I've reflected since then, since I'm all about risk and safety and so forth these days, uh, about how it is that humans keep getting more and more sophisticated about dealing with really very, very risky things um, and kind of convincing themselves they can take the next step for, forward, uh, you know, like dropping hydrogen bombs on North Carolina. And so in this tradition, I, that's, that's kind of what I do for a living, is, uh, is I look at uh, nature with greater respect, greater and greater respect, and, uh, you know, fear, but not quite paralyzing fear. Yeah, so thank you. That was George Church. George is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, director of the NIH Center for Excellence in Genomic Studies, and director of personalgenomes.org, which provides the world's only open access information on human genomic, environmental, and trait data. His 1984 Harvard PhD included the first methods for direct genome sequencing, molecular multiplexing, and barcoding. His innovations have contributed to nearly all next-generation genome sequencing methods and companies. He has also pioneered new privacy, biosafety, environmental, and biosecurity policies. His honors include election to NAS, NAE, and Franklin Bauer Laureate for Achievement in Science. He has co-authored 370 papers, 60 patents, and one book. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, and to The Forest by My House for never teaching me a lesson. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.